I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom, recording from Oneonta, New York, at the Let Me Think Scholarship Workshop, organized by Joshua Myers. Today, I have a friend and special guest uh, you've met many times before, John Harland in California. We're talking about why we care about SU2. And uh, this is uh, specifically a shout out to Francis Howard, uh, who will be defending his PhD. And uh, you uh, may well have uh, viewed his uh, distinguished lecture, the very first distinguished lecture uh, for the Math for Wisdom community. Uh, and so together with Francis, we're uh, preparing to start a study group. Uh, we will have an after talk party uh, about his talk and there we will decide the details, but we have a special request that uh, uh, upcoming Dr. Francis Howard uh, teach us about SU2. So just for context, this is why uh, Dr. John Harland and I, Dr. Andres Kulikowskis, care about SU2. Take it away, John. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, I you know I told others that this would be a, a bit of a jumble. I, I'm studying SU2 right now. Um, so you know, the problem with graduate school and you learn this stuff is that it ends up being taught on a kind of an abstract level and so you you know i took a whole I don't know, year long or two semester long two quarter long uh course in geometrical physics with ted frankel when i was a grad student i learned about differential geometry hodge theory and manifolds and everything but i never worked with anything specific it was all very abstract so you know when you stand back from that many years later you kind of know what it's about and you kind of don't you know so i'm trying to i'm trying to understand physics right now in particular spin one half you know the, the simplest spin system in physics um and so it turns out su2 is key to understanding spin one half and i'm finding myself <clears throat> very um shaky in terms of seeing and being able to manipulate the actual connection between so3 and su2 uh, and in fact then i find <clears throat> so i'm so i'm sort of <clears throat> just the algebra book the group book and um, I'm finding myself having to review every single concept in different geometry, concepts in complex analysis, <laughs> complex, you know, um, just the whole idea of the derivative of a multivariable function. Now, some of the stuff is under, you know, like very much in my, in my knowledge wheelhouse and some is not. So what I'm doing is going back from scratch and trying to understand SU2 um, from the point of view of uh, the connection between SU2 and SO3 from the point of view of the stereographic projection. It turns out the stereographic projection has all these aspects to it that can be swept under the rug that I'm finding very fruitful to, to uh, spend time with. So I'm, I'm spending quite a few hours with every single aspect of this to try to work it into my knowledge and now the reason i'm interested in su2 again and spin one half is of interest to me to understand um singlet states and you know the way they transform according to ro rotations and and whatnot um i'm trying to understand bell's inequalities in detail um so i have an interest there <clears throat> but i also have an interest in um, understanding the dirac equation and um so there's that whole connection and so i've read part of penrose's book on on spinners in space time and i'm sorry i'm forgetting the other author um and um it seems to me that you know 
understanding the stereographic projection, understanding this whole setup, you know, that, that you see uh, the connection between SO3 and SU2 is very important for understanding what Penrose is doing in that book. Now, why am I interested in that sort of thing? Because I'm interested in the Dirac equation. Um, why am I interested in the Dirac equation? Because I want to do for the Dirac equation what I've been doing for the Schrodinger equation, this, uh, what I call this projection between classical and quantum uh, uh, dynamics, in particular their unitary representations. So I'm interested in the connection between non uh, between the relativistic um, dynamics, according to Einstein, um, and the Dirac equation, and trying to understand it via this operator theoretics theoretic sense. Now to understand the Dirac equation, I feel that at, to understand at the level I need to, I need to understand spinners in in some level of detail because I feel you know that um, to get this connection that I just mentioned, I'm going to have to understand what it what it takes. What are the what are the mathematical prerequisites of a unitary representation of a dynamical system that is Lorentz invariant? And my suspicion is that there are no scalar unitary representations of Lorentz invariant dynamics, um, that there's only spinner. <laughs> um, or vector or, or tensor, you know, for example, you know, you have a tensor um, electromagnetic theory. So that's Lorentz invariant, but it's a tense, but it's tensor value. In other words, there's no Schrodinger scalar equation that is Lorentz invariant and is a unitary representation of a dynamical system that is Lorentz invariant. So this is, I'm trying to I'm trying to untangle all this stuff. Um, and and um, I'm really interested in understanding Lorentz invariant dynamics and their unitary representation. So for, and that would, of course, you know, the one one example of that would be the Dirac equation. Another example would be Einstein's gravitational equation. Another example would be uh, electro electromagnetic theory, which both the the latter two are tensor valued, and the former is uh, the Dirac is 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 spinner um, valued. And so the, so I'm trying to I'm trying to get all this working in my head, and I'm taking baby steps in doing it. And um, yeah, so it's a lot to study, but to make it working, you know, to make it work in my in my head the way I want it to, I have to live with it for quite some time. So that's what I'm doing with SU two right now. Anyway, that's my mathematical problem. Francis, I hope you're, you know, hearing us and and uh, thinking about us. And so I can add also uh, from the language of wondrous wisdom, uh, why is SU2 relevant? Um, and there's maybe seven, eight, nine, ten reasons. But the, the first is just very clear that uh, SU2 um, describes um, Mobius transformations. It's the world of Mobius transformations which would be, uh, let's say, maps of the complex plane, um, the extended complex plane. So it's like the Riemann sphere into the Riemann sphere. And so, for example, it maps, um, what, geometrically, we think of it as mapping circles on a sphere to circles on a sphere. And so I gave a talk uh, that is available through Math for Wisdom YouTube channel on um, the geometry of moods. 
And so the geometric transformations of the boundary between a self and the world would be transformations of the boundaries of these circles uh, from one sphere, you know, onto another sphere. This is very, just very uh, directly related. But furthermore, if you look at the algebraic formula for those transformations, they are uh, quotients of differences. You have uh, something minus something on top and something minus something on the bottom and you divide. So that we're familiar with that in terms of slopes or in terms of derivatives, but this is in the complex case, uh, what you get. So which begs the question that what happens when you have the quaternion case, you know, it's quite interesting. So um, that structure is related to what I call the seven sum. Uh, that's the division of everything into seven parts for the logical square, uh, like all are known, all are not known. Uh, there exists a known, there exists a not known. And then you can have three edges. You know, let's say all are known and there exists a known. All are not known and there exists a not known. And finally, there exists a known and there exists a not known. The way I perceive that structure, it's very similar like to this quotient of differences. You're comparing two different ways of looking at things and you're using a third comparison for that. Or like you think of the three minds, like you have the which is basically the same thing. Like, so you have the unconscious mind that knows the answers. You have the conscious mind that uh, doesn't know, but interrogates, asks questions. And you have the consciousness, which decides when they're aligned. So let's say you have two differences, which you're comparing with a quotient. Uh, so, but it there's more. <laughs> so um, uh, SL, SU2 is very much related to SL2. I guess uh, SL2 is the thing that's relevant, you know, when you do the classification of uh, Lie groups and Lie algebras and Lie theory, you actually would be working with SL2 and it can have various real forms. So SL2 would have, the complex SL2 would have two real forms. One is uh, the, com the, the real SL2, you know, in, in terms of reals. The other one would be SU2, which is compact. So SL2, I think, has two real forms when you think over the reals. Um, and what happens there is that uh, SU2, if I have it correctly, is generated by the Pauli matrices. Is that correct? Or? Lie algebra. The Lie algebra, yeah. The, 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 the corresponding algebra. Yeah. yeah <laughs> so, some Pauli matrices. Any, anyways, so the Lie algebra. Yeah, so yeah it's the, been actually done to get the Lie group, yeah. Yeah, so the idea is that... Um, yeah, SU2, the Lie algebra. So the idea is that, um, uh, well, the point is, is that poly matrices are cyclic, you know, that like uh, I times J is K and so on, you know, J times K is I, K times I is J, something like that. Oh, you yeah. can write it in a cyclic, you right. can write it in a cyclic form. Maybe you have to put in an I there or whatever. But the point being that, uh, Okay, so that's the familiar three cycle, which is the learning cycle. You take a stand, you follow through, reflect. So immediately that, that considers, uh, oh, what's the three cycle there? Now, as you mentioned, that's in the Lie algebra. The Lie algebra has another three cycle, which is the Jacobi identity, right? So the, the Jacobi identity clearly has like a learning function to it. It's kind of like the algebra, the Lie algebra is learning the Lie group. You know, and so it's not that um, it's kind of curious, but it's not completely, um, um, uh, you know, it, well, it's just something that my mind would click. Oh, the Lie algebra is learning the Lie group uh, that Jacobi identity has this three cycle. That's what's going on. But see, now, additionally, there's another three cycle with the poly matrices, or maybe it's the same three cycle. Anyways, the point being that in the real form, when you look mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the Lie algebra, the Lie algebra, and the Jacobi. Okay, so the the Lie algebra determines a Lie group, right? I mean, right. Well, up to a certain, okay. well, up up to a certain degree, yeah. It, locally, it determines. It determines Globally, it, it could and... be, globally there could be variations. See, in the in the complex case, I guess uh, it determines it. In the real case, you can have what are called real forms. You can have different global solutions. So, for example. Right. SL2 okay. can be non-compact and SU2 would be compact. And those are, uh, that's if you, see, that's if you don't have I as a uh, scalar. Okay. So if you include I as a scalar, okay. that, so, will collapse. So, yeah. that difference will collapse. 
So the point so, is, if you make that distinction, okay. see, so if you so if you make that distinction, what happens is that in the real case, um, instead of getting cyclic behavior, uh, and this is probably like SL2, the reals, you get a different trinity. It's like uh, you get like X, Y, H. H would be, let's say, the diagonal element. And X and Y would be, let's say, upper diagonal, upper triangle, lower triangle. You see, so you get three generators. And see, but they're not cyclic. There's something where like X and Y are related to H. So imagine like a three sum where like H integrates X and Y in some kind of way. You see, so an example would be like, well, this one all many, if you saw the introductory video for uh, Math for Wisdom, Introduction to Math for Wisdom, I spend a half an hour talking about uh, this trinity, one all many. And so it says like, um, if you're looking for constancy, um, how does it go? Uh, when you're looking for one, you might just find all and you're making the most of many. So the idea is that one and all are kind of like different directions you can go in, but they're built out of many, many kind of like integrates them or many kind of relates. So many would be, let's say the H and the one and the all are like the X and the Y, they're kind of branching out. So that's not a three cycle. Mm -hmm. That's another way to organize, you know, three perspectives. Now, the point being that, see, when you talk about God, for example, but not simply God, but like, like God's dance, there's 24 ways of thinking about God. So you can think, well, for example, let's make it clear, like God in, 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 in Catholic theology, we would say God, the father, God, the son, God, the spirit. But in wondrous wisdom, you know, we could say there's God who understands, you know, the big God, the primordial God. There's God who figures it out, the little godling who appeared out of nowhere. You know, when you reject God, it still it kind of creeps back in by proof of contradiction. And then you have what they understand in common, which is this huge lens or this huge kingdom of heaven or this huge society that they can agree on, which is the Holy Spirit. Right. Like, you know, this is basically what the language of wondersuism is trying to be a scaffolding for. So the point being that if you say God, uh, like I, you, other, like, you know, I am God, right? So, okay, that's one God. And then, uh, mm -hmm. but this Godling says, you are God. But then the spirit from the side says, other is God, that is God, right? But this whole thing uh, from the God, the Father's point of view, it's not a three cycle. It's this kind of like, it's more like this kind of forking, branching out, right? Like there's this branching out. I won't talk about how, but there's another way of looking at that as looking at it as a three cycle, where this the three form a three cycle. You see that there's three modes. So those two things can be thought that way or that way. See, and SUT relates these two threesomes. That's the thing. So that's very important to learn. I mean, this is, I'll add some diagrams when I uh, show this to, you know, but it's just saying like, yeah, SL, yeah. this is a very, structurally, it's very well. Now, so in general, oh, it also happens to play a role in the standard model, SU2. I guess it would be for the uh, weak force. So electromagnetism would be U1. SU2 is the weak force, whatever that does. SU3 is the strong force. And then my guess would be, so Francis uh, is saying, well, taken together, that's SU5. And then he's noting that, well, SU5, uh, according to him, is also general relativity. So there can be this reinterpretation of general relativity where the SU5 for general relativity could be reinterpreted as u1 times su2 times su3 for the standard model and so he's saying well those particles in the standard model could just be some kind of gravitational waves you know that are uh, manifesting the theory of general relativity now what i would add to that is to say well it's ambiguous that's a very nice way to look at it as gravity as the holistic view but another way to look at it and kind of like love so let's say gravity is love you know or maybe like that but another way is to say that Gravity is um, some kind of like U of zero, like some kind of like contradictory thing, right? Quiet, please. Uh, some kind of like a U of zero where um, you have um, contradiction. It's like a state of contradiction. So the fourth force is kind of, well, the, the, the reason being that each of these are describing gauges, like degrees of freedom. But if the level and the meta level have no degree of freedom, but they're the same thing, 
that's when you get contradictions, you know. And if there's like in gravity, it should be kind of taught. There should be no gauge for gravity in a certain sense. So that's the kind of but anyway. So this is all reason to learn um, SU two. But furthermore, these lead groups lay out. I guess the groups are describing gauge theories, degrees of freedom, and that's distinguishing the level and the meta level maybe. But the idea is that uh, um, in gravity there should be no distinction between level and meta level. It should be basically contradictory but that's like that's the basis for contradictions stuff like that can you anyways so this is just what i'm thinking no, about I'm, and i'm not sure why pardon? i'm not sure why gravity is an exception but i'm not sure why gravity is an exception Well, because gravity is the medium um, i think that's the point like gravity is the like if, if you think of it it should be taught so yeah it, it does weird it does have this weird um that's the thing about the gravitational field gravity. Is, there shouldn't be two gravity it's, it's inscrutable it's inscrutable to me um, that the gravitational field is a field because it it does describe the medium, you know, and so fields play out in a medium, you know, it's sort of the substrate, but gravitational field describes structure of the substrate. It's so to me, to me, this the the degree of self, uh, you know the uh, sort of self-referential aspect of the gravitational field. Yeah. And so putting together yeah, like it is, is 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 difficult it's difficult for me to think to think yeah. of. And and you know, in fact, questions come up like my 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 nephew just asked a question about the gravitational field precisely about this. And I couldn't really answer him because I don't understand it. But Francis, on the other hand, spends a lot of time thinking about this. So maybe he can help untangle and so, this and or so at my... least shed some light on this weird aspect of gravity and, and so what i'm curious to do is to take francis instincts and my instincts and try to combine them but the way they would be combined is that francis's instinct um is that uh the see gravity is the meta theory so to speak like it's uh combining because u1 times su2 times su3 equals su5 and so and su5 happens to be the general relativity why can't general relativity just simply be the meta, you know, be, be the combined theory, right? But I'm also, see, what I'm saying is that, yes, but there's another way of looking at it where gravity is a distinct force. You see, gravity is a standalone force. So then in that view, it would be a fourth force. But in that case, it's a contradictory force because it's a contradictory field, you know, because it's a contra, it just doesn't kind of like make sense. Like you can think of it that way, but you're, you're just going to have to deal with something that's self-contradictory in some level. So because level and metal level are not distinguished. So um, that's just a food for thought, but it's a reason for learning SU2. Well, it'd be, it'd, be nice to, it'd be nice to shed some light on this. You know, I mean, I, I certainly want to know more about it. Um, so yeah, anyway, it's a lot to do, a lot of homework that mm -hmm. we have. There's a lot to SU2, uh, you know, just that simple, innocent little group. Boy, there's a lot packed in there. Yeah, so um, I'll continue. So. So then this is just, uh, so then to um, think more broadly, right? This is um, the gateway to Lee theory. I think anybody who participates in math with wisdom is gonna get a lot out of it. And being a Patreon supporter is a great way to show some gratitude for the project. If you heard me. So when we have Dinkin diagrams, a single node is, let's say, SL2, which is SU2. You know, maybe it's really SL2, you know, in the complexes. But the point is, is that's a single node. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to learn uh, Lee theory, my belief is like 90% is given by that node. And then maybe 90, you know, an extra 9% would be SU3 tells you how to connect two nodes. And then basically, like, everything mm. is just repeating those building blocks in chains, let's say, right? So 99% so of you've this... told me this before. So lead, theory, lead groups can be built, can be, can be, can be uh, constructed this way, you're saying? Well, they're just, the Dinka diagrams say that. Generally... The Dinka diagrams say that they're just chained together. There's very few options. And then, like, the last 1% is you can have different widgets. There's four different widgets you can have. Well, in the last tenth of a 1% is that uh, you have exceptional groups, you see. But if you just focus on the classical groups, 
99% is given by SU2 and SU3. 90% is given by SU2. Like if it so to master SU2 and SU3, which I think Francis must have, uh, you know, or, or we'll master it together. So then uh, part of that is that, um, uh, and it relates to Lee theory, is that, uh, well, like the block sphere that, you know, uh, we want to understand the role of the reals, the complexes, the quaternions, right? So block sphere means that, um, that block sphere is SU2 in a certain sense. But what happens with SU2 is that uh, the generators are um, three types of rotations. Like there are rotations uh, in terms of the complexes where you have e to the i theta on the diagonal, e to the minus i theta. They're there are rotations in terms of the reals where you have Andres, something. Andres, can you, can you, can you, is the block sphere, is, is its relation to SU2 the same as the relation as the sphere is to SO3? Is it, is it the, you know, I don't is know. it the geometric but, but, substrate? Maybe, that maybe it, to say like the block sphere is the qubit. So the geometry of the qubit, which is the atom for quantum computing, right? Like Quantum computing is probably built on SU2. It's built on the block sphere. The block sphere is a way of thinking about SU2. Okay. So I'm not talking about things I know. I'm just talking about things on my list of things. So the point being that um, okay. I can put this on the screen, that there's three kinds of rotations, you know, that are coming out. And one is makes sense in terms of complexes. One makes sense in terms of the reals, you know, like trigonometric uh, sines and cosines. And one makes sense in terms of quaternions, like where you have a subalgebra in the quaternions and where it's much more, you know, you pick a unit vector in the quaternions and then you can use that as, you know, in terms of your thing for, rot you can build rotations around it. I guess maybe that's the way it works. So I don't know about this. I need to learn about this. Then um, furthermore, the quaternions themselves have some tight relationship to SU2. And so to understand the quaternions and to understand, maybe it's like unit vectors and I forget how it works exactly. So basically all of Lee theory is built on SU2. And then finally, um, bot periodicity is built on a mastery of Lee theory where you have different, uh, you know, you have different relationships between uh, special unitary, special orthogonal and uh, and uh, symplectic uh, Lie groups uh, and how they fit inside of each other, you know, in a kind of like periodic way that's like an eight period, or in the case of the special unit, it's two period. And so uh, you have to know, be a master of Lie theory, which goes back to SU2. And then you have to be a master of uh, Grassmannians, let's say, and how different vector spaces of different flavors, whether they're complex or real or quaternion, how they fit with inside each other as subspaces of vector spaces, you know, when you define them in the different ways, you go run through all the flavors. So that's why I want to learn SU2. Any more thoughts on okay. that, John? It's... <laughs> no more thoughts. That's it's, all we have. It's a big, it's Thank a big, you for big, uh, Francis for being <laughs> available. If you like this, join the party, you know, watch at least a half an hour of uh, Francis's video, prepare, go through his slides. We invite to the party. We'll be organizing study group. Learn about the study group. Peace, love. This has been uh, Math for Wisdom. Like, subscribe, uh, support us through Patreon. Oh, I just want to say a prayer for Francis and for us. How do we pray? Uh, you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, prayer is not no normally, you know, uh, something I consider myself doing, but uh, you want me to, to lead. You be the uh, antenna for Francis, and we'll, uh, so, we'll back you. So I'll give you some we're, energy. We're, you know, so, yeah, we're looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts on this. And uh you know there, there's a lot of effort in understanding things at a deep level you know and not necessarily deep stuff but things at a deep level to me is a great deal it takes a great deal of of um very uh concerted effort and so i'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts about this as being a step in that direction uh, for me um and uh, i look forward to our 
to our conversations. So, so um, this path that I've been on, that I've been sharing with Andrews, is kind of very personal for me, and you know, a large part of it is sort of building building my knowledge structure, and to me, that takes a great deal of effort. You know, so I spend a certain amount of time each day in that sacred place you know, when I'm dealing with my uh, frustration and elation and all the other emotions that come with trying to learn something in a deep way. And, you know, I I uh, look forward to sharing that path with you. Um, to me, it's a great deal of effort, but it's it's meaningful to me. And and you know I, i'm 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 uh, grateful that i have people to to discuss and collaborate with so there we have it <laughs>